Good morning. Thought I'd start back doing a few devotions. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody for your kind thoughts and prayers for myself, my mom, and wider family at my dad's uh, passing. He's absent from the body and present with the Lord. And um, looking at the passage in Mark's Gospel, where I'll pick up from where I left off a, a few weeks ago, I thought it was really poignant to, in light of that, but also for all of us who are facing challenges at this time with facing death and wondering about the future, etc. So uh, if you've got a Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 5. I'm going to pray and then uh, and read from there. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that we can look to you, the author and a finisher of our faith, as we open this passage this morning. I pray it will bring light and life into our hearts through your word, I pray. Amen. Picking up from Mark chapter 5, and uh, where I left off some time ago was that Jesus had crossed over to the other side of the lake and he was met by a man called Jairus whose daughter was dying and he asked Jesus to come. Jairus was a synagogue leader, but on that journey today, his journey was interrupted by a woman with an issue of blood and Jesus he brings healing to her. Now that's what we're going to pick up and um, from the passage. I've always wondered about Jairus and the frustration of waiting that he has, such knowing the need of his own daughter, but at the same time, the Jesus's journey to his daughter being interrupted, and then this sad news comes to him. So, reading from chapter five, verse thirty-five, while Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any more? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion and people crying and loudly wailing. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's mother and father and the disciples who were with him and went to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kuma, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. And he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. We get this incredible resurrection story here of a healing which goes beyond healings so far in Mark's Gospel. I've got this dramatic moment. Imagine that your Jairus stood there waiting uh, while this other woman is being healed and your daughter is so desperately ill, hanging on, hoping that Jesus would just get there in time, only to hear the very, very sad news that's presented in verse 35. And there's two things presented. One is fact, one is a false interpretation. The first one was, your daughter is dead. Whoever wants to hear news like that and how heartbreaking that moment must have been for him. But then we get this false interpretation. Don't bother the teacher. So often we get information that comes to us, but then how we choose to interpret it is not necessarily how God would ask us to see. It's a reminder how this, this story swings like a pendulum from a, like a, on a clock between human despair, but also divine possibility. The daughter being dead is one thing, but not to bother Jesus is another. Jesus is a Lord of life and death. And if he has a say over anything, he has a say over this and Jesus overhears this conversation and interrupts them and says don't be afraid just have faith these are really important words encouraging and he overhears this conversation and Jesus won't let this false or fake news this fake interpretation of the fact stay he says just believe don't be afraid what a word for us at all moments is don't be afraid of whatever situation we're facing. Just have faith and trust with God right through the midst of everything. The evidence is there, but Jesus knows better. And I wonder how Jairus must have felt at that moment. 
I kind of wonder what kind of faith that you must have had, perhaps cling, cling on to Jesus as the only hope in this seemingly hopeless situation. So often we may cling on to hope, thinking that we only cling on to Jesus because we have nowhere else to go. Well, actually, we're clinging on to the one who has the Lord and life over every circumstance. And that's what Jairus is called to do. And that's what the first readers of Mark's gospel are going to do. And we get to this theme when Jesus gets to the house, of this inside and outside kind of narrative. This is not new. We've already had Jesus inside the house and his family on the outside. And this continues here, but only Peter, James and John, this inner circle of the three disciples, are allowed to go with the family. When they turn up at the house, these professional mourners, there was actually a guild was formed in first century Judaism, uh, which required that at funerals, that even the poorest people in Israel should hire at least two flute players and one wailing woman. Well, I know that I've been in the midst of sorting out uh, uh, funeral arrangements, which are slightly strained and strained for my own family. Um, but um, we've not got official mourners, certainly not flute players and a, a wailing woman. What gets me is that the daughters only died momentarily. These guys had hung around for long to get there, which kind of wonders, wonders if they're kind of professional hawkers seeking out a moment to make a fast book. But also with that, when it comes there, when Jesus announces that she's only asleep and not dead, these so-called professional mourners are turned from wailing to laughing, to pouring scorn at Jesus. You see, Jesus speaks of death as sleep only because it's no more serious than slumber for Christians who believe that Christ will raise them when they return, and they laugh at them. One commentator says, the hard-core realists of these mourners, mourners found, they're found in every age, who decide that the empirical realities foreclose any divine possibility. I wonder when we're facing even death, where we're wondering that that is the end and there is no room for divine possibility. Well, Jesus goes in, he puts the family out and he touches the, the, get the, the girl. We know that um, touching a dead body would have made someone ceremonially unclean. Yet again, this is not just anyone, this is Jesus, a son of God, who's not made unclean, rather than his power, his cleanliness, which has just gone and raised the, uh, stopped a woman from hemorrhaging from blood, now brings this little girl to life and says his wonderful words, Talitha Kumi, which means lamb or youth arise. This statement um, is like a command and it causes this girl to come up and wake up. And it's interesting what Jesus does at this point. He calls for quiet that is kept to them. I wonder how they could have kept that to uh, themselves for some time, surely not for very long. But it seems to be a, a moment of hiatus, a moment of peace, a moment for restoration. Then he also commands the girl to be fed. I've also thought this was strange because if Jesus has the authority, he could have healed this girl and given her a full stomach instantly, but no. I wonder whether that was part of the restoration, how God uses supernatural but also natural means. There's no difference in God's book, but also it shows to the parents that the child is their daughter restored. Not no spirit, not no ghost, no zombie-like creature. And it, food becomes a moment of restoration for this daughter back to Jairus and Jairus's wife. Well, what does it tell us about God? It tells us about his supreme authority. You see, when the people came to Jesus and said, don't bother the teacher, we are people who Jesus is always interested. He's never, nothing can be presented to him which he's incapable of speaking into and he's not interested in bothering with. Jesus comes and speaks with an authority and a power like no others. And like Jairus, we face situations where Jesus speaks to us and says, just believe, just believe, have faith. I wonder where God is calling you and me to have faith today, perhaps in the big things, perhaps in the small, perhaps facing grief and loss, perhaps not wondering, wondering what tomorrow or the next week or month may bring in the midst of all this crisis. Well, Jesus says, look to me. There is no crisis which is beyond me and my authority. Just have faith. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us at this time to look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, the one who brought calm over this situation, just like you calmed the sea, just like you healed the woman's mission of blood. Now you bring this little girl back to life again. I pray, Lord, that you'd breathe life into our hearts and minds today, that no matter whether we have 
for great faith of faith the size of a mustard seed we declare our trust in you for today i pray amen god bless keep looking to jesus